but I didn't go away to minister. I went away and was ministered to, watching all those kids, 42 nations, walk down the graduating lineup in Christ for the Nations. Dallas, Texas was awesome. Uh, so honored, uh, they actually asked Justin to carry the Canadian flag. They had 42 flags go down. And there was a third year Canadian student that actually should have taken the flag, but they actually chose Justin to carry it. So he carried the Canadian flag down. We were, hey, 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 we were excited. You know what's really neat about Texas? There are Ford trucks everywhere down there. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, just a great state, you know, so it's okay, Earl. Um, anyways, praise God. God is so good. Yeah, that's right. God is so good. Um, just a couple thoughts came to my mind here as we were, uh, as we were worshiping too. God did not call us to be popular. He called us to be faithful. <laughs> and so here we are in Windward. God did not call us to be popular. He called us to be faithful. How much popularity can overpower faithfulness sometimes? Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us. I don't care for a popular church. I just pray we're faithful. Amen. Because I will guarantee you, popularity in the kingdom is not popular to the sinful nature. Amen. Popularity in the kingdom of God is not popular to the earthly nature. Popularity in the kingdom of God is not popular to people that are still living old covenant rule. Jesus Christ was not the most popular person on the face of this earth. Matter of fact, majority of the people did not like him, but he was the most faithful. He was not the most popular, he was the most faithful. And then what Kevin shared just during transition here that just sparked something in me. Everything you don't have victory in, you shame what Jesus did on the cross. Everything that you don't have victory in, you shame what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you. And that's heavy. Actually, I had great joy when I came in this morning. But it's actually a positive statement. Because the love of Jesus, the love of God encourages us not to be defeated by anything of this earth. Actually, not to be defeated by anything, period. So if we don't carry victory in the time of trials and tribulations, then we actually aren't carrying what happened on the cross in our hearts fully. That makes sense? Because what happened on the cross, when Jesus died on that cross, he took your sickness, sin, and death away from you. He took it away from the devil. He took it away from earth. He took it away from everything. And you say, yeah, but, 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 but what if I'm still sick? Don't live in the loss of victory of the cross. Know that it's been taken away from you. It's been defeated on that cross by the stripes across his back. You're defeated. You've been, that, that healing has been healed in you, that sickness. But you see, a lot of people, they say, well, if I don't, if I'm not here next year, then I haven't accomplished what I'm called to do. But that's not the case. The case in God's eyes is, what did you do and how did you learn in that year? Running the race as if to win doesn't mean that everything you do is for a crown at the end. What it means is that everything you do allows you to carry the crown at the end. Running, running a race, as you prepare to run a race, you get in shape, you exercise. Let's say you're a bicycle, competitive bicycle rider or you're a competitive runner. What you do is when you prepare to run the race is actually more important than the crown at the end of the race because the crown at the end of the race is not that you're better than everyone else. It just means you've prepared to wear the crown that God's given to you. But you see, we all get competitive to such a nature that we're competing against each other, but that was never the intent of Christ dying on the cross. The intent of di Christ dying on the cross was to give you the ability to carry the crown that God already has for you, and that crown is yours and nobody else's. 
When you were born into this earth, born under the, the, the law of sickness, sin, and death, you're born under the old covenant. Let me phrase that. You're born in the new covenant, but under the old covenant curse. Does that make sense? But when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it brings you from old covenant curse into new covenant victory. And new covenant victory is that sickness, sin, and death have been defeated on the cross. And if they were defeated on the cross, there's a crown for you and I to carry. And the crown for you and I to wear is your crown that was polished and given by God. It was known before the foundation of the earth. And that crown is for you to wear and nobody else can wear it. So if you don't wear your crown and you contend for someone else's crown, you actually don't have the victory of the cross. It's what, it's what God has created us to be, individually unified in his kingdom presence with power and glory from on high upon our lives, filled with the Holy Spirit empowering us. But so often we, we, don't, we look at the race of life, and some of us get content, and we're, we've, we've made the first quarter mile, and now we're just content with that quarter mile race in our life and 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 the drive that 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 training that equipping for the the next quarter mile isn't in us we just start to oh i'm getting slower i'm getting older i'm just content with what i'm doing let's let everyone else win the race but you can't let no one else will win the race for your life only you can win that race and some of the greatest victories is when you're in the trials and tribulations of the physical earth, the physical world around you, whether it's sickness, whether it's disease, whether it's uh, uh, mortgage issues, whether it's divorces, whether it's uh, someone's died in your family, uh, whatever, this, whether it's accusations. Anyone ever had accusations against them? They hurt. Sometimes you'd rather have a, a sickness than an accusation come against you. And sometimes those accusations can feed you into sickness. Why? Because we get consumed with the loss of victory instead of living in the victory where accusations can't hurt you. So anyways, that's not what I was going to preach, but I was going to talk about running the race. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. Let's go there. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. I was the little busy bee on the flight from Dallas to San Francisco and popping these thoughts and words, these scriptures came into my head. Amen? 1 Timothy 2, verse 8. I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere. That word men is plural for both male and female, if you look at the original text. It means the men of this earth, the man, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's everybody. I desire, therefore, that everybody pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without anger, without wrath, without concern, without frustration, without hurt, without doubting, without fear, without fear of, of what someone might think, without fear of the Lord, without fear of everything that takes you out of the fear of the Lord, because the fear of the Lord is uh, what we're supposed to walk our lives in without wrath and doubting. So, he, so here, here the word is saying to lift up, every one of you, lift up hands and pray. But it says holy hands. Lift up holy hands. Well, how do you lift up holy hands if your hands aren't holy? You actually choose into the level of the kingdom of forgiveness of the cross, what the cross did for us, and you begin to lift holy hands even though they haven't done perfectly right. They are called holy because of what the cross did. Does that make sense? So, so you can lift up holy hands by living in what for forgiveness and restoration did on that cross. Yeah, it's interesting I, 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 what Kevin was saying, and I had someone, you know, ask me the other day, you know, you don't have a cross on the wall or this and that, and, and I don't like to celebrate the, the cross, I would rather celebrate the tomb, the empty tomb, right? But at the same time, the cross is what brought us into the new covenant ability of what we carry. And we can't be fearful of the cross. Wear a cross around your neck. And you know what? I was brought up in my traditional upbringing, don't ever wear a cross because the Catholics do. Well, guess what? Wear the empty cross if that's what it is. Just don't have Jesus hanging on it still. Because Jesus isn't hanging on the cross anymore. It's empty. I would rather, I would rather you wear, I would love you to see an empty tomb if you could make a necklace like an empty tomb and the stones rolled away and the angels on top, Rawr! you know, and all the guards have fallen down. It'd be quite a little picture. Maybe you could tattoo it. Please. You didn't hear that from me. 
Some of you have heard the story of the Hiroshima uh, and a father and son. I just want to share it briefly here because it's kind of the thrust of what this message is. And back when the, the bomb was getting ready to be dropped in Hiroshima and this father and son and, and the father was a, 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 a producer of fruit and, and you know, he, he, he said, son, you come to market with me today. And the son was so excited, they got up at daybreak and went out and picked the fresh produce and, and the son was excited. It was the first time he got to go with dad, you know, on the back of a horse, like, a, like an oxen and a cart and uh, all the way into the city to do produce. It would take, they would leave before daybreak and they'd get back at dark. This is the first time this young boy got to go with his dad. He was so excited and he got up early and he was helping his dad pick the fresh vegetables and and everything and they loaded up their cart and uh, and the ox, uh, the cow started to to pull the cart along and and very slow and as they go, the sun was just starting to come up. And as the sun just started to come up, they saw one of their neighbors, one of their friends that they knew a few miles away. And he also had gone early, but he had left before daybreak because the earlier you go, the better place you get to sell your produce in the, in the town square. But he had left a little bit before daybreak, and I guess the oxen wandered a little bit off, and the cart got into the ditch and, and got stuck in the mud. And, and uh, in a way, it was kind of the competitive, you know, because this is the guy that's trying to sell his produce, and we're trying to go to sell our produce. And, uh, and so, so the dad says, son, let's stop and help pull him out. And the son's like, no, dad, no, dad, we got to get there. We got to get there first and get the better place and start selling our produce. And the dad says, no, let's, let's pull him out. And so they got off their oxen and, and they spent hours, hours pulling this, this guy out. And uh, just as they were getting him out of the ditch and they spent hours and they knew that, that by the time they got to the market, the, the main people would have bought all the produce and they probably you know, don't have many, many product left to people to buy the, their product. And at that moment, a huge flash came from, from downtown Hiroshima. And it's a true story. And what ended up happening, because they had stopped to pull that cart, their neighbor, out of the ditch, they were spared their lives, and they survived the bomb on Hiroshima. And, uh, and it just sort of puts in tone what a good Samaritan is. It puts in tone a little bit of what we're called to do and what does the prize look like that we're running the race for. Because what race are we running? Are we running a race to be the best we, we can be, to be above everybody else at the end of life? And at the end of life, you die, and then now you get your crown? Is that what happens? You, you, we go, go, go on this earth. We serve, serve, serve church. We do everything we need to do. We, we give her and give her without receiving the rewards here, but the reward is the crown as we get into heaven. That's how I was brought up. It's a thought pattern that always came. But then I realized as I dove into scripture more and more that that actually is already given to you, that crown. The crown when you die is already given to you. The thing that you need to carry is the crown of each day. The opportunity that each day, the race is won today. It's run and won today. Not at the end of your life. At the end of your life, from glory to glory, but you have to be in glory to go from glory to glory. If you're not in glory now, how do you go from glory to glory? Scripture is clear. You'll be transferred from glory to glory. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Everyone runs the race, but one receives the prize. But everyone that ran according to scripture and purpose in God, in other words, you run to win your race today, you receive the prize and the victory that was already given to you. In a competitive, in the world sense, everyone running and has trained a Maybe they feel defeated if they didn't win number one that day. But that's because you're competing against other people. But in the kingdom of heaven, you don't compete against others. You actually compete against yourself. Is this making sense to anybody? Let me just, let me just say, who's awake, first of all? Okay, good. This is making sure. Take a deep breath. Okay, good, guys. I just want to make sure. Verse 25. 
And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. It's interesting, temperate in all things. You're, you're, you're consistently moving forward in all things. You're, but opposite to what we think in our physical mindset, because so often we've been taught the scripture is that you run to win the race uh, and no one else will win that race because you push them out of the way, you run over them, you trip them, you knock them, you do everything you need to do to win that race. But the reality is, is the one that's going to win the race is the one that wins the race internally with themselves. Amen? Does that make sense? Because know that you know now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. So here the analogy is being used of a physical race for a perishable crown, but what's actually being talked about here in the parable is that you're running to race an imperishable crown, one that is not perishable. It means it is already there, and it will already be there, and it will always be there. It's just waiting for someone to carry it from glory to glory. Verse 26, therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. In other words, now I run this race, not with uncertainty. I run this race not thinking, oh my goodness, what am I going to do tomorrow? Oh, ISIS is going to invade us. This world's coming to the end. Well, you're right. That's a good prophecy. The world is coming to the end. Yeah, it's a guarantee. I, I, you don't have to be prophetic. You just have to read the word of God. It will come to an end. How it's going to get there, none of us really know. But whatever you do, don't live in the fear of the unknown or the fear of what you think is going to happen or the fear of what somebody else tells you is going to happen. That's, it's the worst thing for us to do. I get, you know, I haven't been on Facebook a whole lot and then I just kind of get on and do a few things and it, I started to get frustrated at the amount of fear on that crazy Facebook. It's like unbelievable. You know how many times I've heard that Obama's the Antichrist? Uh, anything that is Antichrist is Antichrist, okay? So it does not just, he's not the Antichrist. Any thought pattern that's against Christ is Antichrist. You know, we, we get, well, good night, we'll speak the guy into existence then. I, you know, you're against a president, no matter what nation, and you believe he's the Antichrist, well, quit speaking it. Start praying for him. It's a tough job, probably tougher than you and I got. I have a feeling he's got more stress than you and I carry. Every president I've watched go into power, comes in with nice dark hair, and comes out gray. I mean, seriously, do they dye their hair or what bleach? Well, I don't know what they're doing, but they're, they're, obviously there's a lot of stress, no matter who you are. We have a prime minister that's a Christian, a born-again believer. We have a province next to us that voted in a, a government and whatnot. I don't know a lot about it, but, but it's like everyone, I started reading, oh, no, no, Alberta's going down the tube. It's like, come on, why, why let it go down the tube? Start praying. Lift up holy hands. Whoever's in power has been put in power. Whatever king is in power, whatever pr prime minister or government or, 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 or politicians in power, they've been put in power. And if they're in our nations, they've been freely voted into power. And we need to lift them up and pray for them. Will they make the right decisions? No. Do I make the right decisions all the time? Yes. I mean, no. Verse, okay, verse 26 again. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. That's like running without knowing where you're going. What's well, interesting? I thought we don't know the future, but that's a lie. We do know the future. We know the future. You might not know how many hairs are on your head, but God does. You don't need to know that. I brush my hair in the morning, and I look at my brush, and I start crying, and I think I'm going bald. <laughs> Kidding. I'm joking. Actually, I don't lose many hair. It's like this thick thing. You know, it takes forever to do this hair. <laughs> One day I'll come, and it'll be zzzz. And you'll go, where'd Brent go? In the buckets. Don't run with uncertainty. What does that look like? I've exercised. I've exercised. It's like, where are you running to? The prize. Well, where's the prize? The first prize of that day, of that moment, of that year is internally in you. Be 
because the prize that Jesus Christ gave us was a redeemed man or woman, forgiven, saved, healed, delivered, and set free to go tell everybody else that they are a prize. But sometimes we run around like a chicken with its head cut off. Anyone ever seen that? Some of us long timers have taken the head off a chicken. That thing does not know where it's flying. It was hard for me as a little kid growing up in the mission field to eat chickens after that. One time, my dad says, okay, son, it's your turn. That chicken, I, I, I swear, stared up at me with tears in its eyes. And it messed me up so bad, I got half it. That was bad. And I quickly went, Ooh! That's what a missionary kid grows up with. I was probably about five years old. No, I'm kidding. I was in grade three. It has nothing to do with the message. But what's that old expression, a chicken with its head cut, running around like a chicken with its head cut off? Well, that's why. Because that's what Scripture's saying here. Therefore, run, but not with uncertainty. Uncertainty means you run a million and one directions, but never get anywhere. Uncertainty means you you bring you know, one, one, one terrible thing in your life into another and to another and another, and you just start living a depressed lifestyle. That's called running with uncertainty, the race. Uh, frustration after frustration. Anyone ever felt like, man, God, I just need a break? Everything just piles up and piles up and piles up and piles up, and, and, and I feel like I had breakthrough, but then the next day, I, uh, this happened. We need to find the breakthrough in this day. For every situation. Don't run with uncertainty. Run with certainty. Don't beat, uh, not as one who beats the air. That's like punching in the air and there's no one there. You say, yeah, but I'm warming up. Warming up for what? Don't beat your arms in the air and do nothing with it. Take your, your sword and your shield and use it when it's needed. But don't just flail it around at somebody who you don't know. Yuck, 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 yuck. What do I do with my sword? Well, <laughs> double-edged. Double-edged. You know why double-edged sword is so important in battle? Because it cuts up and down, left and right, either way. It cuts on the back stroke as much as it cuts on the front stroke. Don't, don't, don't let this just blast in the air. Save our words. Bridle the tongue. And let it speak like a sword when it needs to speak like a sword. And that will bring truth, not lies, not accusations. It brings truth. Because Jesus Christ came as a two-edged sword. He came into this earth to divide good from evil. He didn't come in to, to mingle with, with sin. He didn't come in to, to say, well, a little sin's okay. He came in to say, turn the sinful world upside down. Turn it upside down. Look at verse 27. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Every one of us are preachers. Every one of us are living testimonies. Every one of us are gifted of some form or another. Out of the, the five-fold ministry, every one of you carry at least one, if not multiples, of those gift mixes. And God's calling us into a lifestyle that will bring Him glory. Does it mean that we're perfection on this earth? No, but we're striving for perfection in Him. We work towards that. We walk towards that. If we've got an issue in our life, get rid of the issue. Let it go. If you're going to cut something, cut the issue out. So his light can shine in a greater level. 
One who receives the prize, that, that word receives means to obtain. In the Greek word, it means to seize, lay hold of, overcome. So what it's saying is when you seize that prize, when you run for that prize, it means that you lay a hold of, you overcome. You overcome things that's actually winning the prize that the word is talking about here. That's actually carrying that crown. Overcoming means you win the victory. Every day. Every day. And so many of us get wrapped up in what happened yesterday. But you have to overcome yesterday and let yesterday become the power of testimony. So today will be the power of testimony tomorrow. And don't bring in the issues. Take a look at Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25. Luke 10, starting in verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him. This is tested Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So here's a lawyer, a learned man, a learned individual, is standing up in front of the crowd to speak to Jesus, to test Jesus. Verse 26. And Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? That word law, it means the rules and regulations as to what you live by. So many people are paranoid of the word law. Don't worry about the word law. The kingdom of heaven is full of law. I thought, thought Old Covenant died. Old Covenant did die. That law of Old Covenant was there because of what the Israelites were living the lifestyle of. They had to come into the law of Old Covenant. Jesus Christ brought the law of New Covenant. What's the law of New Co Covenant? Saved, healed, delivered, go into all the world, preach the gospel, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, and cleanse the lepers. This is the law of New Covenant. It means it's what's being done for order and structure for something to be accomplished. So he said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? You're a learned lawyer. What's your interpretation? How do you read this? Verse 27. So the lawyer answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Verse 28. And Jesus said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. Verse 29, but the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? You mean the guy that lives across the street from me or beside my house? Verse 30, then Jesus answered and said, and he brings this parable. A certain man went, uh, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. So if he was in Jerusalem, he was probably coming to worship, and he's going back to Jericho. And fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. So here is a man who was, who was, who was going back to his home place, going back to whatever he was going to do. And robbers came and stole from him. They beat him up. They stole his clothing. They wounded him, and they left him half dead. Verse 31. Now, by chance, a certain priest uh, came down the road. Now, this priest is probably from the tribe of Aaron. They were, they were really, literally, the full-time ministers in the temple. They were the ones that would, would, would actually uh, go in to the Holy of Holies, behind the curtain, behind the veil. They would go into the presence of God. These are the guys right here. These are the ones. They've been trained. In other words, they're basically saying, if you take it into New Covenant, what they're saying is that the ones that are truly on fire for God and serving Him fully, that's these ones. Okay? Now, by chance, a certain priest came down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And so when the priest saw this wounded, beat-up person, we all know that it was a Samaritan and we all know that the religious structure looked at Samaritans as dogs. They were the lower class of people. And so here's this priest who's also probably just come from Jerusalem walking to wherever he was going. And he sees this beat up individual, but it's a Samaritan. Now, if it was a Jew, it might have been different. What's it saying here? Don't let prejudice take you out of victory. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they're Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, it doesn't matter what religion they are. Don't let prejudice take you out of the victory that God has put that person in your life for. Okay? Okay. And when he saw him, he passed to the other side. Verse 32. Likewise, a Levite, 
When he arrived at the place, now a Levite is from the tribe of Levi, and they have been raised up. Many of them are worshipers, but they were servers within the temple. Some of them full-time, some of them were part-time, and they would come and serve. They would make sure the altar was ready. They'd make sure the building was clean. They'd make sure the, the things were, were done and, and in order, that the priests were doing this other thing, and the Levites were kind of doing this whole thing. And so here's another person that's a server of, of the temple. So likewise, verse 32, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and paused and passed by on the other side as well. Verse 33. I'm sorry, the, the, the Samaritan now, the, the guy beat up was a Jew. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. Now, the, the person, the Jew that was beat up, the, the person that should not have approached him would have been the Samaritan. It would have been the most unlikely individual because of, of all the stuff that's been talked about that, that race, the Samaritan race. But a certain Samaritan, you notice he's a certain Samaritan, not a good Samaritan yet, he's a certain Samaritan. As he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. And so he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring an oil, pouring on oil and wine. Interesting, he poured on oil and wine together. He poured oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the next day, when he departed, now that phrase, when he departed, isn't in the original text, but that's okay, it, it means the same thing. On the next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was the neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And the lawyer said in verse 37, he who showed mercy on him. And then Jesus said, go and do likewise. If we know the scripture, do we understand the scripture? Here's a man that is suffering. He's in misery. He's beaten up. And I want to be clear on this because sometimes there's people that are just professionals that pull in on your compassion. And that's not the situation here. This guy was legitimate. He was beat up. He had been robbed. He had been left for dead. This parable tells about a priest that missed the prize. What was the prize that day? That prize at that moment was that man needing help. That was the prize. How many of us stop on the side of the road if there's a need? How many of us, you know, there, there, there's a lady out there trying to change a tire in the middle of a rainstorm on the highway. How many of us guys will stop, you know? Now we get paranoid. Well, what if I stop and... You know, it's not very good. You know, there's a guy and a girl. It's like, get out of the fear. Help the person. I love Sean Bolt's statements, you know. He says, we, we accept the homosexuals. We accept them in. We don't agree with them and their, their stance, but we accept them in because we love on them. It just, Sean is just this whole realm of love. I mean, it's just a, a very intriguing man to talk with. It's amazing. But actually, the priest had the, was the one that had misery. How many of you feel good when you actually finally help somebody? How many of you don't feel as good when you know you're supposed to and you didn't? How many of you will turn around and go back when you know you missed an opportunity, you go back and try to fulfill the opportunity? Who was more miserable, the man that was beaten or the spiritual person that did not have the compassion to help? I would say the spiritual person was more miserable. Yeah, but you don't know the suffering of, of the beat up man. You don't know the suffering that priest has gone through. Also a Levite, a worshiper of God, a preparer and a server of the temple, also crossed the road and walked down the other side. What kind of misery was he in? He looked and passed by on the other side of the road. Here, here's a Levite. Here's a guy that serves in the, the temple. He, he knows better. He knows right from wrong. Then the Samaritan came along and poured oil and wine. He was just a Samaritan until he helped. Then he became the good Samaritan. You can be just a priest, or you can be a good priest. You can be just a Levite, the puppet. The problem is, is if these were puppets, the wrong person was holding the controller. Verse 34 so he, the good Samaritan, went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. 
the new wine that Jesus Christ gave us on that cross and by the power of the Holy Spirit. That new wine and the new oil replaces everything of the old covenant. And it brings us into a new understanding. It brings us into a, a realm of power and authority that if we choose to walk in and we choose to step into, you will walk in victory every moment of the day. Well, how do you walk in victory every moment of the day? You choose to step into the victory. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. Don't lose hope. Stand up strong. Stand up courageous. Have the fire of God and the Holy Spirit in you. Be that good Samaritan. Neighbor, the word neighbor in the Greek is plesion. It means a friend or somebody we come in contact with. That's what we're asked to do. People that we know. It doesn't have to be the beat up individual on the side of the road. But I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. Don't let the opportunities pass. Can I have some piano? Don't let the opportunities pass. If we let the opportunities pass, what we'll look like is defeated, because we will be. If we let the opportunities of what God has put in front of us for this day pass us by, or we pass it by, we will live in a defeated lifestyle. Because you can't choose your victory. Jesus already chose it for you. You say, but I, 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 wanna, I wanna go this way, I don't wanna do that. I, I, I don't wanna help the homeless, I, I wanna do this, you know. Well, callings are callings, I understand that. And what I want us to be aware of, so many of us think compassion is money, it's giving money to people. No, it's not. Giving money to a drug addict is not helping him. It is, it, giving money to somebody that com continually makes just bad decisions and ends up homeless because they continually make bad decisions all the time, all the time. And you go down and your compassion is, well, it's easier for me to give you a thousand bucks every day. You're not helping them. That's like a child that keeps messing up and you keep giving them more things to mess up with. It doesn't help an individual. This, this person, this, this Jew that was beat up and robbed and mugged, he was legitimately beat up, robbed, and mugged. He wasn't a beggar on the side of the road. And we have to have the wisdom to know what is compassion of God and what is wisdom to bring counsel to people. Because so often people get wrapped up in this lifestyle, a depressive attitude, a, a, I don't have victory in my life. A, oh, Brent, you can preach victory because you have victory. You guys don't have a clue what my life contains. I mean, some of you do. You see me here on Sundays and some of you have gotten to know me. You don't know what I carry and the stress levels I carry. You, you don't know all that aspect. Yeah, but Brent, you got victory. No, no, I choose victory every single day. And you're right, I got victory. His name is Jesus Christ. He died on the cross, rose again to give me victory. And I am running for the crown and it's my crown that God has already made for me. He's already prepared me in advance for the crown to fit my head perfectly and I need to get my head shrunken down a little bit to, so it'll fit me a bit better. Because before my head was way too big. Way too big. It's one thing to be full of pride and it's another thing to understand your identity. And so many people get messed up with the two understandings. Yeah, but you don't know the gift that I carry. I'm a prophet. Okay. Can you take wise counsel? Why do I need that? I give it. Big. Let me take a pin and see if I can pop it. You know why a zit forms on faces? An infected root hair or dirt in a pore or something, I don't know. Sometimes they need to pop it. That's gross. But you know what? That, that's, that's like a prideful head. It's gross. Seriously. To understand your identity isn't prideful. Most people in pride don't understand their identity. Most people that carry a lot of pride don't know who they really are 
So they need to be something they're really not or something they want to be, but they're not there yet because they're trying to get to the end of the race and not actually train and run the race day by day. If you try to get to the end of the race to get this crown that nobody else is going to get, your compassion for other people isn't going to be there. You're going to push people out of the way. And I feel like the Lord is calling us into a realignment, a re-understanding, a greater level of understanding in our own hearts. To know that the crown you're running for is the crown He's already given you. We just have to get our body in shape proportionately to carry that crown. You won't take it from anybody else. If you try, it ain't going to work because you can't carry someone else's crown. You carry your crown because you're created in the image of God Himself. And His Son, Jesus Christ, is the crown you're to carry. This is Victoria Day weekend. Long weekend here in British Columbia, Canada. Celebrating Queen Victoria's birth. Interesting. I say it's celebrating victory. And we're the Queen. It's called the Bride of Christ. We're the Queen of Christ. We're the King of God. Sorry, the Queen of God, the King. That's what we're called to be. The Bride. The Queen. We need to adorn ourselves appropriately. We need to adorn ourselves. How do you adorn yourself in the kingdom of God? By the oil and the wine of His presence. To have the oil run down your head and through your beard. You say, well, I don't have a beard. That's okay. Run all through you. It's called unity. Running down the beard of Aaron. Because we're called into something more than what we were doing yesterday. And if we don't get out of last week, we're not going to step into this week. I just feel like some of us, some of us need to just let go of what's physically happening in you, around you. We need to just let it go and step in to the crown of today, the victory through Jesus Christ. Let's all stand. Right after the service today, I just want to ask everybody or anybody that wants to be baptized, please let's. I'm going to beeline right into my office. We're going to, we're going to meet in my office quickly because we have a baptism happening next Sunday, okay? Next Sunday, we're going to fill the tank up with water, okay? Can I just have a bit more volume? I'm just straining my voice because I feel like I'm not quite loud enough. But, um, so if you have, some of, many of you have wanted to be baptized next Sunday. That's awesome. But if you didn't know we were having a baptism and you want to be baptized, come into my office right after. It's going to take a few minutes and uh, just share with you a bit of baptism, but just briefly what to bring next week. Glorious day, isn't it? When you baptize and get baptized. That's just awesome. I love it. That's, that's letting go of the old and bringing in the new. Well, let's get baptized today in the Spirit. Right now, just get baptized in the Spirit. He's let go of the old and bring in the new. It's a new oil and a new wine every day. Every day it's new. It's not even like manna. Manna was the same thing. It was new every day, but it was the same thing. The new oil and the new wine is new and fresh every day, but it's constantly deepening and growing deeper and richer. It's, it's, it's getting better and better. What, what happens when you have a bottle of wine in the ages? It's better and better. Better and better. We need to be in the wine. You know what? I need to get a bar in my office. I'm just kidding. I have water bottles in my office. 
I have Coca-Cola, a few other things, but... It can't be consumed in the physical. It's not the wine, it's not the booze we're talking about. It's not the drunkenness we're talking about. What we're talking about is stepping into the river of His presence and glory. It's all choices. It's choices. I chose it when I woke up this morning at 6 a.m. My clock hadn't gone off yet. And I looked at it, I thought, seriously? I went to bed like three, four hours before that, seriously? But I thought, you know what, God, you want me to pray. Come on. And I drink, drink, drink. The barrel. Do you believe it's a new wine? New oil? Oil of healing? Drink in your healing right now. You need a healing? Drink in your healing. <laughs> you know? It's there. That's, that's, that's what the cross paid for us. It prepared so the Holy Spirit could come upon His people in the upper room. Well, get out of the basement and get in the upper room. You know, basements without windows are kind of depressing over time. Solitary confinement, they put you in like a basement setting with no windows. Because it's depressing and it's, it's, your, it's your punishment for, for not obeying the laws of the prison. Well, guess what? One, we're not in a prison. And two, we're not in the basement. I look out the windows, the sun is shining. It's a beautiful day. I look at each of you. The sun is shining upon you. It's a beautiful day. Rise up and shine. Be the light of glory. What are we called to be? The light to this earth. Salt and light. Salt makes people thirsty. It also purifies and keeps bacteria out of wounds. And light dispels darkness. To drink. The disciples were accused coming out of the upper room. They were accused of being drunk too early in the morning. <laughs> that means they probably had great joy on them. They went from fear of being killed, locked up because the tomb was empty, and a body being stolen was the accusations. To all getting a little bit more bold in the upper room because you know what you get bolder when you gain, gather with people of like-minded hearts and they started to drink doesn't say anything about liquid wine it just talked about the fire and tongues of fire the Holy Spirit how did they get it how did they get it they went to the upper room expecting it they didn't even know what they were expecting They'd never seen it. They never felt it before. They just went to the upper room expecting and waiting, like Jesus said. Wait for the promise of my Father's Holy Spirit upon you. And they went into the upper room, and what did they do? They stayed together. They gathered together. I don't know if all the doors were locked. Chances are they were. And they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed. And a crown was put on their head that day. It became the turning of the world upside down. That's what we're going to do in the tank next week. We're going to turn that sinful nature upside down. Bury it and drown it in the water. And come up fresh and renewed. A further commitment to our salvation is baptism. So drink. How do I drink, Brent? I don't know. Drink. You know how I drink sometimes? I say, okay, God, I'm ready. I enter in.
Enter it. Drink of his presence. Drink of his glory. You're saying, aren't you going to wind up? No, I spent 10 minutes on drinking right now. The sooner you drink, the sooner we get out of here. I'm just kidding. No, 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 no. The doors are all locked. We're in the upper room. We can't get any higher than this. I'm just tired of the old. I'm just tired of the boxes. I'm tired of the walls. No boxes, no walls. Drink in your miracle. You need a healing, drink it in. Well, how do I drink it in? I don't know. Open your mouth and drink it. I don't know. Open your heart, drink it into your heart. Physically, I'd say, you know, you do that, right? But spiritually, you can just do that, and boom. We're, I know we're a crazy church. I understand that. Amen for craziness. I don't want to finish. I actually am quite content here right now. You know, the amazing thing about new wine and new oil, it brings contentment into your life. It brings, like, all the issues and problems like kind of flow out funny that's interesting I find it sort of intriguing how dripping honey land flowing with milk and honey and I see all these bees flying around the building but they're just to produce honey I feel like I don't know I'm drunk actually right now no, I actually am. Like, I used to drink this a lot, you know, back in my wayward years. And I feel the same right now. I just, but different. I feel fulfilled. I feel like I won't have a hangover tomorrow. I tell you, I'm getting wrecked. I don't know if anyone else feels this or not, but I don't even care. <laughs> you know, it's just weird when Holy Spirit comes on you. It's like you just kind of lose all ambition to perform for anybody. It's like, I don't want to perform. I just want to be real. The reality of the kingdom is freedom. The reality of the kingdom is joy. What does it say? Joy unspeakable. You can't even speak it. Ma imagine that. It means that your joy isn't spoken. Yeah, I'm happy today. I'm in a good mood today. How are you? You can't even speak it. You got to be it. You know, they say laughter is, operates so many, I think the most muscles of your body at any one time. It's interesting. Wow. Imagine the upper room right now. That's what I'm in this vision. I hear Ed in the background there. A few others. Wow. Let's just put our hands, if you, if you want to put your hands out. I just entered this vision as soon as we put our hands out. I just felt like these other hands went in, but they were heavenly hands. Huh. feel like there's a light switch with these heavenly hands that are in your hands but the light switch is in your mind feel like you could just turn on the heavenly hands because the scripture said lift up holy hands and pray and so father we lift up holy hands hands of your kingdom hands to do your kingdom work hands to do your kingdom ministry on this earth father and we thank you father for your son jesus christ that you sent to that cross the mighty cross of calvary 
because of the price that needed to be paid to bring us back into the intimacy that you created us to have with you. And I pray, Lord God, that if anything comes out of this service today, it'll be intimacy with your presence. That it will create a hunger in us again, Father, to hunger into your presence, into a deeper and a new level of your wine and your oil of heaven. We're here to worship you and celebrate your name. The name above all names. Because of this weekend of victory. This life of victory. Devil, you are defeated in the name of Jesus Christ. Sickness, cancers, you are defeated in the name of Jesus Christ osteoporosis you are defeated in the name of Jesus Christ any disease in the heart and the liver you are defeated in the name of Jesus Christ oh and did I mention cancer I know I did at first I feel to repeat it and cancer you are defeated in the name of Jesus Christ and so we thank you father for the greatness of your kingdom come your will be done in each of us as every day we carry the crown of victory the crown of victory in your precious and holy name and all the people said amen, amen. Staring